Remember stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I'll be Bradshaw. That would be the Chickasaw Nation Hall of Famer and Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And this is the best of show. We've got some of the craziest stories, some of the wildest experience, some of the greatest legends in the history of this business. And today, Mr. Briscoe, we get to have the best of. That really bothers you saying Oklahoma's finest, doesn't it? It does, because that didn't go well together. Yeah, it <laughs> does. Yeah, it does. Oklahoma and fine doesn't go well together. Oklahoma and a lot of things go well together, but not fine. Oklahoma great then. Oklahoma's greatest son. But I'm, I'm not. I'm, Jim Thorpe is the greatest son. Then Wahoo, my Daniel. Then Jack Briscoe. Then me. And then Danny Hodge. Well, they had they Danny number five. Well, you're He's the top a, five no matter what. Yeah, no matter what. Yeah, Danny Hodge. With, yeah. with Jim Thorpe, Wahoo, yeah. and your brother and Danny Hodge. That's pretty good top five. That's pretty good company there. So, man, this is the greatest job. You know, when you look back, you know, almost two years I'm having to work with your ass and check his <laughs> ass. And it's hard, folks. You, you got to realize. And I, I'm, nobody, I'm sure nobody out there will disagree with me. You're, you're even on this show, he's a bully to me. Oh, yeah, that's know? what I am. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And you, but but uh, as our friend Dave Silver said, you're a bully with respect. So I appreciate <laughs> the respect part of it and, 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 and the bully part because I'm a bully. You may, you may be a bully, too. But, you know, two years we've been doing this stuff. Man, we've had a Hall of Famer after Hall of Famer after Hall of Famer. And after, and then Tony Chimmel. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, anyway, we, we, we decided to go back at the end of the year and go back and kind of rehash. And, man, we amaze ourselves because we're that good. We so are good. We, you put together, John Layfield put together some of our greatest clips ever. We hope you enjoy them as much as we do. And that's part of this show. We enjoy having the people on and hearing the stories that we've known forever and hearing their stories again, just like you folks do for the first time. So, John, take it away. What do we got rolling here, man? We're starting off with a great one. The You know, a great pairing on TV was Dave Fit Finley, one of the greatest of all time, and Hornswoggle, one of the greatest of all time. But their backstage pairing... <laughs> far exceeded anything they did on television. And our first clip is the time that Dave Finley tried to sell Hornswoggle <laughs> to a Philippine businessman in the Philippines. I, know. I love Dave Finley. He's one He's one of my, uh, Dave, oh, I, I think the world of Dave. But how about him trying to sell you in the Philippines? So we're in the lobby of the hotel in the Philippines somewhere. And, you know, it's, I, I see this guy looking at Swoggle like he's looking at a meal, right? <laughs> I go, hey, you you want to buy him? He went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I go, oh. So I've got swaggled by the by his collar. I'm holding. I go, now this guy and myself are talking money. We're going, well, how much? <laughs> and he, the swaggers looking up. He's going like, wait, wait, no, what are you doing? <laughs> no, I'm going to sell you. Be all right. I'll get you back. He was trying to sell me to a man in the Philippines. The man was trying to offer him money, and he just keeps pushing me closer to him. So this guy that I don't know. And I'm not understanding what this guy wants. And then it clicks. Oh, he's trying to buy me. I would have done it, but the money was right. But uh. <laughs> well, did they get a good offer or what? I ran, Jerry. I <laughs> ran. Another fear. I don't like dogs. Dogs, when I was a child, dogs jump. And they, when they, I look, when I was a child, I look, I pretty much look a wiener dog in the eye. Let's be honest here. <laughs> So when they jump on me, I get knocked over and I don't like that. Dogs, I don't like. This tour alone, Dave tried to sell me to a man in the Philippines. And it might have been this tour or the or the chicken one where a, a rabid dog, a wild dog out tried to attack me and he sat back. He tried to push me down a volcano. We went to we went sightseeing and we were in this in a, the nice volcano, and he just gives me a little shove. I, I, he he has put me through so much hell, and that I still love him for. It's the most love abusive relationship that I've ever had, and I love him for that. Unfortunately, he got Hornswoggle back, or never sold him. We're not sure. Actually, we love Hornswoggle. We're glad that Dave didn't sell him. But John, I heard a story that that Horn, uh, Horn uh, Dave actually sold the guy actually bought uh, Hornswoggle and kept him for like ten minutes 
and decided he wanted his money back. <laughs> <laughs> and paid pay Dave to take him back. Yeah, paid Dave. So Dave got paid twice for Hornswoggle. <laughs> well, we got, all we got a story that might up. even, that, that, that can match this one. And this is two guys you know very, very well. Okay. And I'm talking about Dusty and Dick. Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch, Captain Redneck, the West Texas Outlaws with a donkey in their hotel room as told by Greg Gagne. You know these guys pretty well, Mr. Briscoe. Well, that's the reason we were able to get Dusty and Dicky down here because they had to, they had to leave Minnesota because they were riding that donkey into, into establishments that they shouldn't be riding the donkey into. So <laughs> I was happy to have them down here as my brother Jackson. And this is a this is what a what a story Greg told. This is a story by Greg Gagne about Dusty and Dick and an Appaloosa donkey. It's about midnight. Wally Carbo gets a call from the Edina police. Say, Wally. Uh, we got two of your wrestlers here. And uh, he says, well, hey, pal, well, what, what, what did they do? He says, well, they were disturbing the whole complex. We got a call and we came over here and we went, we were, we knocked on the door and they have an Appaloosa donkey. Have the donkey. <laughs> and they're naked and two girls are naked <laughs> and they're drunk. <laughs> there's 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 shit all over the walls. Where did they get the donkey? <laughs> Murdoch found this Appaloosa donkey. They had a trailer and everything for the day. They hauled him around everywhere, right? So they were playing football with the girls. They got them underneath them, you know, centering the ball up. They're playing and the donkey's in there and there's shit everywhere. So oh the Wally goes, Oh pal, Jesus, don't put him in jail. Can you can you just get him out of there? So they tell him, get get out of here. We'll take care of everything. So about an hour and a half later, Wally gets a call from the Minneapolis police. <laughs> hey, Wally, yeah, what's going on there, pal? Well, Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch down here, they got the, uh, the flame bar here. It's a cowboy bar. He said, Dusty is up on the stage uh, singing uh, Johnny Be Good. And Murdoch <laughs> came ro riding in on an Appaloosa donkey. And they both pulled pistols out and they started shooting the ceiling. <laughs> what should we do with them? <laughs> so, so, oh, Jesus, don't, don't put them in jail, please. <laughs> so the next day they call Murdoch and, and, and Rhodes into the, into the, uh, into the office and they're talking to him and Vern calls Eddie Graham. He says, Eddie, can you take Murdoch and Rhodes for a while for me? He said, we got them, they got in some trouble up here. So we got to send them. We got, I got to get them out of here. I got to get them out of here, or they're going to go to jail. So he said, "Send them down here." So Mur Murdoch and Rhodes go down there. So the first night, Eddie's got them. They're going to wrestle in Miami, and they're in Tampa. And he says, "Okay, guys, here's the deal. You know what happened up in Minneapolis? We can't have any of that shit going on down here." So are we straight? Yeah, yeah, we'll be good. Don't worry, Eddie. We'll be good. He said, okay, can you, we got two of the midgets here. Can you take them with you to Miami? So they drive to Miami, they wrestle and they come out of, out of the, out of the club or out of the, the arena. And they tell the two midgets to get in the back and they give them a case of beer. So they're driving along and they come up to the first toll booth. Now they've just left Minneapolis after all this shit. This is just the next day, you know, two days later. And if it's, it's all over the papers here and everything. And they come out of the arena and they tell the midgets to get in the back and here's a case of beer. So they come up to the first toll booth. And, oh, Dusty, Dick, Jesus Christ, you guys are back. You know, it's great to have you back. Yeah, well, we got, uh, he says, you know, it's 50 cents. So the guys in the back have it. He looks, he says, I don't see anybody there. So they pull up, they honk the horn and the trunk opens. The two naked midgets put 50 cents in the guy's hand, pull the trunk down and they drive away. They did this all the way up to Tampa at every toll booth. <laughs> they get to Tampa. Now the poor midgets have drank the whole case of beer. They're still in the trunk. And they pull up to a restaurant, all glass windows in Tampa. And they back right up to it and they blast the horn. And of course, everybody's dressed up in there and they turn and the midgets pop out naked and they hit the gas and the two of them fall off against the window and kind of slide down. And then they're, they're running down the road <laughs> trying to ch catch Murdoch and Rhodes. So that was that that all happened in about a four day span. 
pull your pants up there, Greg. <laughs> yeah, no, that's my pillow fell off from my back. I had five back surgeries, so I got a whole little. From one wild team to another, we only need one word to describe this team. Free birds. That's right? two Let's words, go. John. That's two words. That's not two words. That's one word. You Look went to the school. Free, free, and free, and birds. That's two this, damn words. They combine them. Well, you can't combine them and make one word. You got to have two. <laughs> you think Michael Hayes can spell either if it's one word or two? I think all Michael can tell is it's free bird, baby. Name, name, name. <laughs> Don't listen to this, man. It's a great story, Michael Hayes. Any story about Michael Hayes that had a little bit of alcohol is a great story. Name. Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin tell a story in their own words what happened in Lake Charles, Louisiana, moonwalking into a ceiling fan and waking up to bed together in bed naked. We'll let them tell the story. Alexandria, we went to Tiger Town. Jimmy watched me moonwalk into a ceiling fan on a bar. Michael Hayes starts moonwalking on the bar. Well, he's knocking drinks over and stuff, but it don't matter. We just put more drinks back up there, but, and they knew that. But the thing was over the bar, they had these Louisiana fans that they just didn't spin like this, you know, like at the Olive Garden. These things were turning some RPMs. I mean, they were blowing some air. These fans were rotating at an enormous rate of speed. And Michael Hayes moonwalked right into one of them. It hit him in the back of the head. The, the, the blades exploded everywhere. Hayes, he was so good because he didn't sell it too much. He, I think he was out on his feet, but he, he staggered. He didn't fall off the bar, but that fan blade hit him. Did he Without, warm no, no, he didn't warm me at all. He, he elbowed the guy next to him and said, watch this. I had never seen anybody get hit in the head with a fan that was going around that fast. Uh, it was just amazing. That, 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 so I, it's I got so to, amazing that you didn't want to warn him. Oh, no, you couldn't. Yeah, that would be no fun at all. See, that, that, that would have just ruined everything. You know, because, you know, this was, that was, this was really getting ready to be a show. And it was too when that fan hit him in the back of the head. You'll never see that again. Not, I don't know where you'd see something like that. When we went to the Hilton there, right off uh, I-10, they were full and they had no rooms. And so we said, man, are you really sure the guy recognized us? So he looked, they had a big suite. I think it was the governor's suite or something like that, which had this humongous like California King bed, but that's the only bed it had in it. So, uh, we both slept naked at the time, um, usually in separate beds. Now, that really didn't bother either one of us, but it sure did get a hell of a reaction from the guy that brought us room service in the morning. We end up waking up the next morning. We're in the same bed, king size bed, uh, butt naked, laying there with a massive hangover, and we're really, really hungry. I don't know if anybody can match the Freebirds. The APA at one time, if you include Teddy Long and Godfather in the car, might have given them a run for their money. But the time that Teddy Long left Ron Simmons in a snowstorm, we almost lost Teddy Long, Mr. Briscoe. Hey, you know, and, and, and the reason they had JBL, because you they had to have one sane person in, in the car there. <laughs> so between that threesome with, with Teddy, uh, Ron, and, and, and uh, Godfather, man, I, I I don't know how you got out of the car, and you're still a non-smoker. But yeah, I think you were probably smoking <laughs> that night, uh, just from, from uh, you know, cotton, or what they call the old contact time. But man, what a story! Is. Let's sit back and listen to Teddy Long and and, and describe the story. Some of the greatest times ever with those three wonderful gentlemen, Teddy Long, in his own words about leaving Ron Simmons in a snowstorm. We, you remember we was come from Rochester, New York. We stopped, we, we worked there and we was on our way to Albany. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, you know, it, you know, we drinking, so we done got the beer and we got it all in us. So, but, you know, when you're drinking beer, you know, you got to piss. So, you know, everybody wanted to pee. So I finally pull over and, you know, John, he's always on me. It, I mean, it, he never let up off me at all. Pull a car over, what's wrong with you? Don't you see people got to piss? Pull it over. <laughs> So, so everybody got out, so everybody pissed, and so I got out pissed, so I got back in, so I'm thinking everybody's in, so I, sl everybody, I got in, slammed the door, so I drove on off. Next thing I know, John looks over at me, what are you doing, idiot? 
I said, what are you talking about? I said, I'm going on to the town. You idiot. You just left Ron standing in the snow back there. I'm like, what? He's not in the truck? So now I got to bag up at least a mile on, yeah. the, on the median because I can't get off nowhere. So I had to bag up about a mile. So when I Ooh. finally bag up and get back there to him, he's standing there and he's full of snow. And this is before the word damn ever come out. I... <laughs> We bag up and I open the door and he looks at me and he says the same with damn long. <laughs> Ron, by the time we get back to him, Jerry, Ron's standing on the side of the road with one hand on his hip like this and he's got <laughs> snow built up on his hair and on his arm. <laughs> he was so mad. And we pull back in there. Teddy says, now tell Ron I did not do that on purpose, which he didn't do. So when Ron gets in the car, I go, can you believe Teddy did that? He's been laughing at it. <laughs> oh, he, he, he just, Jerry, he just straight up buried me immediately. Ron, can you believe what he just did? He he drove off and left you purposely. Can you believe? Look at him. <laughs> Ron, was, Ron was so mad. Ron wouldn't say nothing. And Ron, you know, Ron doesn't sell anything. And Ron, Ron, nothing. Ron just sitting back there, didn't say nothing. I said, you guys want to pull over and just settle this and fight? <laughs> you shut up <laughs> yeah yeah he's keep on trying to get ron to beat me up i'm like what are you doing i just i didn't mean to do it i didn't know he wasn't in the truck one of the greatest road stories ever though mr briscoe is something you know very well and it is a t-shirt in florida this is an exact replica of it but it's close enough to it so if you want to go on boxing gimmicks and then dave silver our friend will help you out there leader of the pack I mean, it was a battle each and every night, and some of the battles we had, Barry Wyndham, <laughs> Magnum T.A., gorgeous Jimmy Garvin, Brian Brer, myself, and Jack Briscoe, and somehow the Briscoes ended up with a T-shirt all the time, but Jimmy claims to have uh, have uh, uh, ownership of it, and so does Magnum T.A., and they both have replicas of the, of the original T-shirt, and John, I've showed, showed you the original one here in my possession, but you know what? It's their story, and let's listen to it. <laughs> Magnum T.A., the great Magnum T.A., Hero Stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw, talking about the most famous shirt in wrestling history. About this leader of the pack thing that's so infamous, and they start telling me the stories about it, and how Jimmy Garvin was the reigning leader of the pack, and, and this, that, and the other, blah, 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 blah. And, and I said, well, you know, we I guess we'll just see what we see. And... Uh, and so the deal was, you know, if you if you challenge for the shirt and you could challenge any time, any day, you, you didn't get like a day off. It's like 24-7 title, right? Right. The Terry is like that hardcore 24-7 yeah. title. You can challenge any time, any time. Exactly. So, you know, and they would use that against you because obviously if you were peaking every night, if you're if you're hitting 28 to 32 to 35 beers a night, you're getting a little, <laughs> you're getting a little thin in the skin, you know. And then to top it all off, at the end of it, if you were you were challenging the, the champion and maybe he did outdrink you, well then, or he or you outdrank him, you could challenge for a takedown. You could have <laughs> one takedown to see who could get control at the at the tail end of it, wherever you'd met parked up that night. So Jimmy and I had our deal and, and I was in I was in pretty good shape. So I put him away pretty, pretty significantly. And he was a, he wasn't feeling too good, but he didn't challenge me for that takedown. And that turkey, he got out. We were in front of the Days Inn down there in Tampa. And he shot before I was even knew he was coming. And I grabbed him by two handfuls of hair and plowed his beak right down through the grass and made a little plow mark with him. And, and he submitted and it was all over. It was good. But it, it, it was the deal. And just just so the legend is is uh, even more. Oh, relevant, man. This is the infamous oh. shirt. And it, oh, and it, man. And, it, and it, it's stained and it's got... It's got it's got a sewed up place here on the back where it got <laughs> pieces one time and put it back together. And so and we can gr we can grab place. we can grab we can grab shirts and stuff like that. And, 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 and we love good fights. We love good heat. And sometimes they come together out beside on the side of the road. And sometimes they're in the ring. The great Bob O. Bob Orton Jr.'s father, Bob Orton Senior was one of the greatest heels of all time. And Captain Lou has a story about him, Mr. Briscoe. It's unbelievable. 
It totally is, and, and you know, us trying to enhance it does no good at all. Let's listen to the basic story. My old tag team partner who I love dearly, Bob Orton Jr., telling a story about Captain Lou Albano going to the ring with a gun to help Bob, his dad, get out of the ring. Uh, dad was probably the hottest heel in the country for for a long time. You know, I, I mean, he was just good, slow, easy, one of the best workers ever to step into a ring. But boy, he knew how to get that heat. And back in those days, you know, people wanted to hurt you. Hell, even when I first started out, people, you know, you had to be careful around people. Nowadays, I don't think it's quite as bad. But uh, yeah, the, uh, that night in particular, someone had uh, dead dropped two straight falls and still had so much heat. And when he left, some guy was, was standing up on the bleachers and hit him in the head with a chair, which knocked that out. And uh, Lou Albano went out with a gun and a couple of guys, dad's knees were just, just scraped almost to the bone where they had, had dragged him out of there. But if uh, Lou wouldn't have went out with the gun and uh, made people back off, you know, they, they might have killed him that night. But uh, from that night on, he never got that deep, serious heat because, you know, he just he was too dangerous. Now, me coming along, I, you know, I tried to get it, but I could never do like that. You know, I, I wasn't my dad, that's for darn sure. He was the best I've ever seen. That was awesome. I, I remember when I, like I said, I was just a rookie starting in Oklahoma where I ran across him. And Danny Hodge was, of course, you know, the guy in, in Oklahoma. And Danny was, right. a, was a smaller guy. And uh, your dad being the, the man of the man that he was, the size that he was, Hodge, Hodge, they, they'd work that old Oklahoma City stockyard to that old Tulsa Cane ballroom, and there would be a riot in there. And then they go down those towns like Little Rock, Arkansas, right. where they didn't see a whole lot. And uh, your dad was so hot in Little Rock that he couldn't even go go from the hotel to the arena without without a, a, a police escort with him. I remember those days. I remember promoter having the bets because he had to pay the cop fifteen dollars extra to walk your <laughs> you all walk your dad back and forth to the hotel. Sometimes there's just heat among the boys and sometimes the boys are just rivers. There's a time that maybe this was a felony, maybe it wasn't. I don't think it was ever reported. The day that you, Mr. Briscoe, and a certain free bird ran over the hottest baby face literally in the country, Tommy Wildfire Rich. Looking back at it, what was I thinking? Damn, what was Freebird thinking? Freebird, Frisco, I dare you to run over Tommy Rich. Tommy Rich, hell. <laughs> Here, Lasoy. <laughs> Literally, in a car, ran over the hottest baby face in the country. We got Tommy Rich and the Freebird, and of course, our friend, Mr. Frisco, telling the story. Tommy Rich made the big mistake of walking in front of the car while Gerald was driving. And Gerald wanted to drive the car up the steps because you know how mountainous uh, West Virginia is. Uh, instead of driving up the steps, Gerald ran over Tommy, which, <laughs> which of course, Tommy was feeling no pain either. And he didn't sell it at all. He's kind of broke off the windshield. Tommy out to that story, though, Michael, you said, I bet you won't run over Tommy Rich. Now, now get this. <laughs> Tommy Rich is, is our franchise. Tommy Rich is, is our ever-loving franchise. Franchise. This kid, this kid, is the hottest thing that there. And I'll, I'll make a bold statement: the hottest thing there was probably in the business history up to that time, Mary. I mean, definitely. And so, uh, so we're we're both like you said. You know, we're we're good boys. Got driving back, and we we hit the hotel across the street. After you know, where, where's the nearest bar? It's across the street. There's another holiday. But Tommy is already checking in. He's walking up these steps to get to the main part of the hotel. Michael elbowed, I bet you won't run over Tommy. I frick you, man. I put that damn Lake of Continental down in the drive and I hit it. Those tires are squealing. The next thing we can see is Tommy Rich's bright eyes looking at us as he's coming over the hood and over the damn top of the damn, uh, damn uh, roof of that damn Lake of Continental. He lands in the back, lays there. P.S. elbows me. I think you might have killed wildfire. 
<laughs> you get to Gerald Briscoe and Michael Hayes running over you in a car. Isn't that a felony? Well, they'd have thought felony me if they'd have hurt me. Mr. Barnett would have been mad at both of them. <laughs> yeah, the last thing I remember is you coming up over the damn of the windshield breaking, the rear view mirrors breaking, and I walk back, Tommy, okay, and you set up. Are we going to drink any more beer or something like that? <laughs> Let's go. And man, they, you started, and you got mad, and you started, well, I don't know why you got mad we were running over, but I don't you know why got mad, just got run over yeah. with the car. <laughs> Yeah, he walked on up the hill, went to his room. Man, I can't lie. And still to this day, I don't. I, I guess I should apologize today. I'm sorry, I ran over you. Some crazy stories and some wonderful stories about Eddie down in Florida's plane ride. But we got a plane ride that matches the plane ride from hell. Greg Gagne tells us a crazy story about Mad Dog, Mister Briscoe. Well, you know, John, I was on that plane ride from hell, and it was truly a plane ride from hell, and. uh you know, I don't remember much of it, but you know what? I enjoy hearing other people's story and Greg telling this story about about Vashon. I mean, holy cow, I would I would I would have died on the spot. <laughs> they almost all did. Listen for yourself as Greg Ganya tells the plane ride story of Mad Dog Vashon opening the door in midair. Flying down to, uh, to um, Omaha for the matches, and uh, it was the pilot. And uh, uh, I think Nick was the co-pilot that night. And then we had Steve Olsonowski, myself, uh, Baron Von Raschke, uh, Mad Dog, Bobby Heenan, and Adrian Adonis on the plane. So, and Mad Dog liked to play cribbage and he'd sit there and he didn't talk much. You know, and he's a crazy son of a bitch. You know, and he, he's just sitting there and we're playing. And all of a sudden he goes, Greg, can you do me a favor? And I said, what do you want me to do? I am meeting my fiance tonight and her family. I want to wrestle early on the card so I can go meet them for dinner. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll talk to promoter Joe Dusick. So uh, we get to the arena. I told Joe, so they put him on the second match. And, and uh, I see Mad Dog over in, in the corner. Took something, drinks down a pint of whiskey. I said to Jim, what the shit's he doing over there? He, he said, well, I told, I gave him a pill. He was, he had to drive back to Quebec the next morning to pick up his son who was arrested. He had to go to jail if Mad Dog, Mad Dog didn't take him with him. So Mad Dog told Jim he needed something to stay awake. He says, well, take this, but don't take it until tomorrow morning before you leave. It'll keep you up all night. So he popped it then and drinks the pint of whiskey. Into the ring he goes. He's not even gone two or three minutes. He comes back in. I said, what are you doing back here? I killed that kid. I killed him. <laughs> I got to go meet the family. Huh. So he gets he gets over and takes his clothes off. He's got a towel around him. Comes over and sits down by us. And Joe Dusick used to have a case of cold beer in one locker room and then in the other one. And he's drinking a beer. And we're sitting there talking. And he's had about three beers. And I said, hey, don't you have to go? see the family i'll go when i want to go <laughs> okay you know he was crazy to be around so he's there and he's drinking a few more beers and now there's an intermission and then we wrestle we wrestle about 45 minutes so we come back in to get a cold beer the beer's all gone i don't want shit so we go out to the go out to the to the plane and we get out there waiting and all of a sudden here comes here comes a cab up, and Steve Olsonowski gets out, and he, Mad Dog gets out like this. He's got t shirt on with barbecue sauce on it. <laughs> and I said, this, I said, Steve, what the shit happened? He said, Well, you know, he took that pill that, that Jim gave him, and he, he drank some, he drank a pint of whiskey, and Adrian gave him some kind of a pill. And then we got to the, the restaurant, he's drinking wine. And then he got in a cab and he wanted to stop and get a pint of whiskey. And he was getting so crazy. I gave him a joint to smoke. And then he got the other whiskey and he drank that in the cab. She's got, he gets in the plane and now we won't let him sit. At, we got him in the back seat next to, to Adrian. And we take off and Mad Dog kept saying, oh, it's so peaceful out here. It's so peaceful. And all of a sudden we're playing cards and the whole plane goes boom, boom, and we all ducked. And it was 
you thought I thought another plane hit us and took the tail off. It was just, a, and, the, and the pilots yelling at us, close that door, close the door. <laughs> and we look around and Mad Dog is hanging out the door and all you can see is his shoulders and his head. And he goes, it's so peaceful. I feel like flying tonight. <laughs> the pilot says, grab him and get him in. We said, he's going to jump. We're not going with him. Let him go. And then he gets that, that look at him and he starts throwing everything that's not attached in the plane out. Wow garbage can cans of beer the beer case goes he opens his wrestling bag his wrestling boots go the jock strap goes all that and then the bag goes and then he leans back out and you can't see anything but his back and he turns in again goes, it's so peaceful i feel like flying so the pilot's telling us to get him in we got to make an emergency landing and he told us afterwards it was the only plane built that had chains holding the stairs Otherwise, any other plane had blown off, hit the tail, and we'd have gone right down. <laughs> so he tells us we got to make an emergency landing. So we're landing, I think, in Waterloo, Iowa. And we see fire engines, uh, ambulances, police cars, all, all the red lights going, and they're foaming the runway. Everything you want don't want to see you when you're landing. See, yeah. <laughs> and, we went, oh, and he says, okay, guys, you're going to have to prepare yourself, get in the crash position, I'm going to put it down on one wheel, but we might flip over. Ooh. So he, he pulls that thing in. Boom. And we come to a stop. And here comes the fire engines and the police cars. And Mad Dog's in the back. And we look back. And he's got foam all over him. And he's peeling it off. Takes the seatbelt off. He gets off the plane. And he takes off across the runways. Now that there's holding two Ozark Airlines from not leaving till we get till he get us situated and he's walking out towards those where they're going to release him and the police said hey go get that guy and we said you go get him he's yeah. crazy he's trying to be over the door at six thousand feet for christ's sake you know so is that mad dog Michelle? yeah we'll go get him go get him so finally <laughs> steve and i ran out there and just as we get there he turns around and hits us with an open hand and we hit him back, and about that time, this Ozark Airlines goes by, and it was so close, it blew us right over. Yeah. And we got up, and we walked back, and he was still out there, <laughs> like, flailing around. And the police went out, and they were trying to handcuff him, and they couldn't get his hands behind him. And he says, I'll kill you, cocksuckers. I'll kill you. If you do. So they finally get him back to the airplane. He says, okay, you got two choices. You can either take him back with you, or we're going to lock him up. Of course, he turned to us and he was going to kill all of us if we didn't put him back in the plane. So we put him behind the pilot and we put two straps on him. <laughs> he, was, he was like this all the way back to Minneapolis. I'm going to kill you guys when I get out of here. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> so we all jumped out of the plane and left the poor pilot in there with him. <laughs> they got him out. Oh. But, well, we go from crazy <laughs> to just crazy. wow. And that is the man from Borger, Texas. That the is the Borger, Texas wild man. The Texas wild man from West Texas, from Borger, Texas. He always claims to be. I don't even know if he's from. I don't know if he ever lived in Borger, but it doesn't matter. He's Stan Hansen. No. He says he lived in Borger. He lived in Borger. Stan Hansen can live anywhere he wants to live. He's right, and, he can. And man, I mean, what a story. I mean, and you know who who in their physical well-being is going to take that belt from San Hansen anyway. Not, not me and not my brother Jack Sam was probably one of the toughest SOBs you want to face the earth. Plus, you know, he claims he's from Texas, but you look it up, he's a Colorado guy. He ain't no Colorado guy. Stan Hansen's a proud <laughs> Texan, just like Nolan Ryan and Earl Campbell. <laughs> he's a, he's on Nolan Russell Ryan. Moore in Texas. I love Stan, and I love this story. I used to rip him all the time. We all did in Japan. I ain't doing it. That's that. Boo! I ain't doing like, it. I, ain't doing I didn't it. go by. When, when, when Sam looked at you and said, I ain't doing it, you better come up with something else. <laughs> yeah, you better figure out something else. Here is Stan Hansen telling the story and I think admitting that maybe he ran over with the tractor more than once. I ain't doing it. That's that. The, uh, the, the What happened in Denver. You're working for Vern Gagne, uh, and he wanted you to end up dropping the title to Nick Bockwinkle, and you're going back to Japan. That wasn't your agreement, so you walk in and tell us the story about uh, the, the I ain't doing it, and that's that. 
Well, you know, like I said, I don't talk, I, I, I'm not going to talk negative about Vern, but, you know, we did, we were, you know, I, I, first of all, I never dreamed, didn't want it, wasn't even thinking about getting the, uh, the heavyweight belt. I mean, I wanted to go after the belt, not have the belt. But so anyway, they put the belt on me. I kept waiting for them to promote me as the champion. You know, oh, we can draw. Give me Kurt Henning. Give me, you know, somebody that, you know, we can go out there and do it. But we never did it. And then they come in just out of the blue, you know. Uh, they said, you know, you're going to drop it to, to Nick. And I said, no, no, I'm not. And uh, and so, you know, all the bad shit in the world happens in a, in a bathroom <laughs> somewhere. I mean, anyway, dressing room, bathroom. And so Vern's there and, uh, you know, he, he says, what do you mean? And I said, well, I'm not doing it. I hadn't made no money. I didn't want this belt. It's, it, I, I'm not going to do it. And so he got up in my face, you know, and, and I'm looking over here at, at Nick, you know, Nick's a great guy, good guy. I have nothing ever bad to say about Nick, but he'd been working for Vern for 20 years. You know, he, I know where his loyalty lies. You know, so I'm just, so I just, you know, I just pushed, pushed Vern back, you know, not hard. I just, I said, don't get in my face, you know, and he says, I'm not doing it. And that's it. And I turned around and got my bags and went out to the airport and got on the plane and went to Japan. Did you the, walk through the crowd when you left? So they knew you were I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I could remember. I, I mean, I definitely didn't go out there in front of everybody on purpose. I mean, I just left. There's all yeah. kinds of legends surrounded, but now the one legend that I don't think I think surrounds it is very similar to the movie being thrown out the bus. <laughs> you mailed the title belt back to Vern. Yeah, but they, you improved it just a little bit before you did, right? <laughs> I did. It was a piece of shit to start with. I must say, sorry. I shouldn't have said that, but I mean, it was an old belt that they had had. And I, from what I understand that some kind of convicts made it in a prison and gave it to, you know, so that I had a little history and everything to it. But anyway, it was beat up and everything. And so, you know, they, uh, it was beat up. And uh, you know, Did so you Ver, 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 the the shoe, with a ball they're going to sue me and all this. You got to send the belt back, and I I sent it back, and it was beat up a little more than it was when I got it. But <laughs> did you, did you happen to run over it with the tractor? Well, you know what, the tractor kept going in circles. I couldn't believe it. I could not keep. <laughs> Anyway. So you ran over it with a tractor a few times. Uh, you know, we will never know. Or a four-wheeler. <laughs> no, it was a tractor. <laughs> okay, we got the truth right there. <laughs> it was a tractor. Uh, Mr. Briscoe, what we have next was one of the most pleasurable shows we ever had. Because I didn't know much about, I knew about him, of course, but I didn't ever was around him. Scott Casey is one of the most interesting, fun characters we've ever had on this show. And the story he told is world class. Well, you know, John, you go back to many years, you know, back in the years, all those rumors about UFOs, you know, and we, we they were out part of the United States. You're not poor from uh, what's, what, uh, what's that, what's that uh, uh, area of, 15 or 51, 50 or 51. 51, area 51 out, out in that part of the wood. They weren't too far from that stuff. One night, Scott Casey's going along with a very credible guy in Mel Mascaris. And then, folks, if you ever run into Mel Mascaris, because he's out there doing autographs, ask him to verify this story and get back with John and I. But man, listen to this story, and when you, you'll know what we're talking about. Scott Casey, Tom Jones, Wahoo McDaniel, and Mel Mascaris. I'm not making this up. Run into a UFO. As On their way to 7-Eleven. <laughs> that's right. As told <laughs> by Scott Casey, prepare yourself for this one. As God is my savior, it was a UFO. 
<laughs> and I don't remember the the mile marker. The we mile came marker. over this hill. Now listen, this thing is hovering <laughs> over over the ground. Mascaris is talking Spanish. Tom Jones, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh God, oh Lord. Wahoo says, I think I'll stop and see if we can book them on the next show. I said, if you get your fat ass out of the car, I said, I'll leave you. <clears throat> he started laughing. Gentlemen, it was hovering over the ground and these lights were shooting around like this, shooting around it. And I swear, uh, and I, I talked to Mascaris the first time in years I saw him at uh, the gathering in Charlotte. And I said, do you remember? He said, the UFO. I remember it very well, my friend. And I went, oh, fuck. I mean, I, I, I almost shit myself. I, I, you know, especially when Wahoo said he wanted to get out and book him on the next show. <laughs> oh, God. But anyway. Oh, oh, so was, what happened to the, to what happened to the spaceship? I don't know. Maybe it went to a 7-Eleven. I fucking don't know. All I know is that we got the hell out of there. I was not about to sit there and let something come out there. And it did, it did go. It did hover along the road there with you or just uh, what, what did you stop? Did you stop? You didn't stop the car and let Wahoo out. We, we slowed down and I said, Wahoo, if you stop this car and get out, I'm going to Leave your fat ass, and that's exactly. And I was scared to death of him. I'm afraid he'd kill me when I said well, that. Well, you know, you could have done the world a favor at that time and stopped the car and let Wahoo get in that damn place. If we would, we would, if Wahoo would have got in there, those aliens would have surrendered in no time at all because he would have chopped every one of them to, to Haiti. Oh, anyway, but we, we left and we came back uh, the next week. You know, it was a weekly thing. We came what back. The, what, the, what the UFO was the weekly thing? It was no, it was gone. It was gone. <laughs> it you was know, done. That I, was it. And I'm telling you, that was the scariest I've ever been in my life. I thought if that door starts sliding open, I'm I'm running in the field or something. I'm going to get away from it. It was. So cool. they must have done one of those little scams. Uh, there's no intelligent life for this automobile. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. If, <laughs> if you ever see Mascaris, you can ask him. <laughs> now, Tom Jones is dead. Mascaris is uh, uh, alive, and I'm alive, and Wahoo is, is dead. So there's only but, two of you left that can verify this. Right. Absolutely. Scared maybe, maybe really. there, maybe there's something to that. Uh, I know, I well, Mascus, you know, he's he's not known to be a big bullshitter. He tell you the way. No, he's not. No, no, he's a good guy. So what All did right. it look like? Was it, it was, a saucer? It was kind of like saucer, but it it looked kind of long. And the, on the outside, they they had lights going around like this, and. What color were the lights? Different colors, red, green, orange, blue, purple, you name it. They they were, I, I thought, somebody's pulling a rib on us. But was, no. was, it, was it solid? Was there any noise to the thing? Was there any what? Noise, did you hear anything? <laughs> I, if, if we did, it, it was behind me because I was it was behind, yeah. So you were, you were the fastest of the two people. Absolutely. So uh, you out, no way. So you outran. Huh? You outran a UFO on a, on a West Texas uh, desert road. No, oh, give me that bullshit. No, we were still in the car. You know, no, I, I, I know, but your car outran a UFO, Scott. Follow me here. It's difficult. I know you're from Texas, but follow me. Here. John, how do you put up with this bullshit? That's what I, <laughs> I have no idea, and I've done it for thirty years. <laughs> wow. Oh, he hired yeah. me, Scott. <laughs> He yeah. hired me at WWE, and ever since then, I've had to put up with it. I'm glad that a UFO didn't land in Oklahoma. Oh, well, shit. They'd have been selling hot dogs for a dollar a piece. <laughs> uh, we got a curio shop that we would have been sold to all kinds of souvenirs. <laughs> we would we would have monetized that thing, Scott. <laughs> for you that don't know, because you're monetized, means you make money off of it. <laughs> <laughs> see, you see what I mean, Scott? That's what I got to put up with. Pitiful. Pitiful. <laughs> Jerry, I've got a picture of me and Jack, and I, I don't know if you're in it or not. We're in Japan with Moose Morowski. Remember Moose? I remember Moose, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but 
I just so what's this you have to do with the UFO, Scott? Nothing. I just it just when you get <laughs> so my what age, happened just, with the UFO? Finish the story about the UFO. It left and we left. You know, it, I, left, I, I it left before you guys did. Now you wouldn't let Wahoo out. Did you must have slowed down when you saw it? We did slow down. He no, slowed you down. Slowed he down. was driving. Well, yeah, Wahoo he was, was driving. driving. Wahoo was driving. It was his Cadillac, but. I told him, I said, if you if you stop and get out, I'm leaving your fat ass, and that's that, that, that the truth. You know, I mean, hell, you know, none of us had any guns on us or anything like that, and uh, I didn't want to get killed or, you know, right. we might have been on Mars or Saturn or something by the time they got through with us. I don't know. Well, made made event made event on, on Mars. I've been I've been the first. Scott. Yeah. Anyway. Would you Wahoo, Wahoo, Wahoo would have wanted you to put him over, I'm sure. <clears throat> Say what? Wahoo would have wanted you to put him over. If you had a gun, would you have shot one of the aliens? <laughs> if he'd have come at me, yeah. Hell yeah. Wouldn't well, you? Would you want some little green thing coming up on you? Grabbing your <laughs> testicles or whatever? I mean, how do you know? Probably. How do you know he was green? I well, that's just what they call them all they're green or gray or something like that so that was your only experience with the ufo scott do what now that was your only experience with the ufo nope uh, no went... wait wait a minute you what, uh, what? Had more encounters listen to me i'm listening you know where you know where palladura canyon is no but that's 18... actually probably does i know exactly 18... where it is okay he, he, the, he, he, got, he got the, his first one there. Do you remember the lighthouse? The big John, John the lost lighthouse. his virginity there, Scott. <laughs> yeah, well, good. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. He was twenty. He was twenty-four years old. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, <laughs> see what I got to put up with, Scott. Yeah, I mean, it's pitiful, isn't it? It's awful. <laughs> So we're at the canyon now, and the UFO. It's by Canyon, Texas. Anyway, I've been there. We get we he, a friend of mine, Andy McCullough, there in Amarillo. I don't even know if he's still around or dead or alive, whatever. But anyway, we climb the lighthouse and we get up there. So I said, "Can we get back down?" He said, "Not tonight. You can't. We got to spend the night there." And we did cross ties with the rope and we slid under them so we wouldn't roll off the side. It was like four or 500 feet down from where we were. So we're laying there and, and you hear the cows mooing and birds chirping and whatever. All of a sudden, it, a red flash came right over us with this intense heat and went straight up. And the time I looked up, it was gone. And I said, Andy, what was that? He said, that, my friend, was a UFO. I said, you're shitting me. He said, no, that was the first time. And I, it was, I mean, the heat, it felt like, felt like it does now when it's hot. Uh, but I mean, it kept twice as hot. It was unbelievable. And I just, I said, let's get out of here. He said, we can't. <laughs> you know what shale rock is? It's rock that lays right. on top of each other. But you. You don't want to try to climb on it whenever you're in the dark because you could fall off and kill yourself. So we stayed up there, but the rest of the night there was no cows mooing, there was no birds chirping, nothing. And I mean, I I think I slept about two weeks looking around, thinking maybe it'll come back. I don't didn't want to get carried off. So you stayed there anyway, two weeks? No, I said two winks. Oh, two winks. I said I didn't sleep for two winks. I was scared, uh -oh. you know, but outside of that, that's the only two times I ever saw it. But I'm surprised as much as we used to travel up and down the roads that uh, I haven't seen any more. Do you okay. think maybe now, somehow was... you attract UFOs? Look at you, smart ass. I, oh, wait a minute. It was oh, just my... <laughs> that's, a, that's a logical question here. You know, John has never he 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 you know he's not quite up there with you and I, but he's got a few miles on him out in those West Texas yeah. roads and everything. So you you you, you, you attract UFOs. That's you were there. You were sitting with two guys that put on millions and millions of miles coast to coast, border to border, 
and worldwide and never seen a UFO. And you, you've had the honor of, uh, of witnessing two UFOs. Uh, you're quite, a, that's quite a remarkable feat, Scott. As God is my witness. Well, I believe you. I believe you. You never I lied you to me. I believe you do. I just wondered if something about you attracted UFOs, maybe. My good looks? Well, forget that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did forget that a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the way it went. I was pretty back then, though. Well, you talk about crazy things, Mr. Briscoe, and that was crazy. But we got a few crazy guys in the business. And Jumping across the ocean on this one, too. Yes, sir, we are, to the four islands of Japan. And Mr. Orton, my tag team partner, Randy's dad, could not go to one of those islands because he had a hit put on him by the mafia. But we were in Japan one time, and I've always, I never asked you the story. We were going, I think, to Shikoku, the easterly island, where you cross across that long bridge. I think that's where it was. And you told me and James Beard, you go, okay, guys, I'll see you in a couple of days. And I said, what do you mean I'll see you in a couple of days? Because, well, I, I can't go to that island anymore. You were. <laughs> from an entire island and i never asked you why what happened yeah, they, they left me in osaka whenever they went over there to what was the name of kushu wasn't it kushu i think yes but yeah. anyway but anyway i was was uh hell i forget what i was doing it, it probably involved a beer or two <laughs> and i guess i got into it with some of the <laughs> gangsters from there and just slapped the shit out of them and uh, uh, <laughs> the gangsters were going to get me if I ever come back to that island. So they'd leave me in Osaka. They'd go over and do the three days. They went over for them islands, and they'd come back and pick me up in Osaka, and away we'd go. <laughs> but hell, I told them, shit, I'll go over. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you slapped a mafia guy, and you couldn't go back. When, when you go to Japan, that's one thing, you know, you, you're told over there, don't mess with these damn mafia guys. And, uh, well, how do you know if they're mafia guys? They, well, they're walking around <laughs> with nubs on their hands. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. they, they're bad at it. Well, we jumped back across the pond. We jumped to WrestleMania, and we jumped to our friend. And we have more stories with our friend Hornswoggle than probably anybody, ex except for Fit and Finley, and they traveled together. Imagine that car. <laughs> but we've got the story of Hornswoggle's first WrestleMania, Mr. Briscoe. And I had a luggage cart. And, 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 and the two go together. Just just listen to this story. You can figure out what we're talking about. As told by Hornswoggle himself. And, you know, watching the antics. And even that guy sitting up in the corner up there with my Briscoe Brothers Body Shop t-shirt on. He, would, he wasn't immune to pulling a rib or two. Uh, did he ever rib you? <laughs> uh, no. He... This guy saved my job, easily saved my job at my first WrestleMania uh, by getting me to my hotel room at, in Detroit at WrestleMania. <laughs> True story. Oh, man. So, oh, I didn't, so I, I, again, my first WrestleMania, we're in Detroit for WrestleMania 23. Myself and Bob Holly and the Hurricane go to TGI Fridays or something, but it's in the same, it's sharing a parking lot with the hotel, essentially. And I have some uh, sodas, of course, and I go back to the hotel. A hurricane drives me back to the hotel. On the way, it's not even a block. I end up vomiting all over his <laughs> rental car, all over his rental car inside. They now, we pull up to the hotel, uh, right up to get uh, to park so I can actually get into the lobby. Who are the first two people I see? Mr. Layfield and Bruce Pritchard. Oh. <laughs> who pulled up, who they pulled up in their limo, of course, you know, probably had horns on it, I'm sure. But <laughs> it's the first two people I see. And they look at me and they go, Dylan, have you been drinking? And I just look at them. <laughs> it was so funny. Look, I, I Bruce describes it as a child you got who who got caught in the cookie jar. Just yeah, yeah. Nope. nope. <laughs> I don't know the rest. John can finish it because I don't quite know the rest. But all I know is 
after they arrived, it wasn't five minutes after they arrived that Vince's limo pulled up right behind them. And I, man, I can't imagine if he would have caught, saw me like that. Well, what we have is I, I, I tell Bruce, I said, well, we got to help Dylan out. Because the first thing we said was, we were messing with you. He said, Dylan, have you been drinking? And it was the most innocent face that, no. <laughs> he just <laughs> hammered. So me and Bruce get him into the, the production office or the green room, whatever it is. We get him in there. And he, Dylan's not doing very good at walking. So finally, we get a luggage cart and the bellman, and we said, so the bellman said, hey, you got to take him up to this room. And he says, what do I do when I get him up there? I go, dump. dump <laughs> <laughs> so we can't carry him. So we pay, the, we pay the guy to take Dylan up to his room. Yeah. We got him on the luggage cart, got him through, <laughs> right through yeah. there, got him out there before Vince could see him, oh. and got him up there. I love, man. Yes, I, I, it's, it's again, only hell. Your, your my, my first WrestleMania could have been easily my last if that moment, like it just, it's one of those moments that was, it'll, it'll, it's one of my favorite stories that I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, the one of, one of the great things that it's always, it's always so fun to see the expression on somebody's face who, who, who's uh, just been drinking all night. Have you been drinking? Oh, no, sir. No, sir. <laughs> that, that's like, it's, it has to be fun being a police officer for those kind of things because it's it's always an anger or a complete, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah it wasn't even a few. It wasn't like, oh, I had a few. It was no. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, what do we do with it? So we're, we got it with a luggage cart. People, people are like looking like, that's, that's, that's Hornswoggle. Just look the other way. It's yeah. not Hornswoggle. Again, not only is it a, a, a guy on TV, a, 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 you know, a, a WWE superstar, this is a midget riding a luggage cart. <laughs> right, right through the lobby. That's not the way to get it through. So yeah, there were fans there. Thank goodness this was before cell phones, because if there had been cell phones, we'd have had to take them a different way. We knew that no, all they could do is say they saw him. They, yes. they can't prove that they saw yeah. him. Before. We're taking yeah, him through, I, the, <laughs> through the lobby, and people are looking, and they're like, Oh, there's uh, there's JBL and Brother Love and who is that on the cart? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the best. The, the countless number of guys that we've had to have to get to the room during WrestleMania week. I mean, you know, all had goes into the hundreds. I'm sure. <laughs> I can only imagine WrestleMania week takes a toll on everybody throughout the year. Like that, that has to be one of the biggest sleepy weekends ever. One time everything's first. under a microscope, no matter what you're doing, where yeah. you're at, every, everything, everything, and everybody's just under that microscope. Yep. And, 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 and Vince hears everything. Well, Mr. Briscoe, the Hornswoggle was a great story. Your brother, I wish you were still here because he's a great, he's a great man, but he might kill us if we told this story. And I'm scared of your brother as much as I'm scared of you, and I'm pretty scared of you. This is a story about a great rib by Don Slatton. In Abilene, Texas, Mr. Briscoe. Oh, Don Slatt, you go back in the history. Don Slatt is the guy that captured Billy Saul Estes, a famous Texas uh, manipulator. Imagine a, a manipulator and a, and a guy that, that started the, 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 the Ponzi schemes and all that stuff. He was, but he was a big time. Don Slatt, I arrested him. Don Slatt was a promoter in, in, in Texas. So Jack was out there, and they wanted my brother Jack, you know, to stay a, an extra day or two. Listen to the story and hear it all in detail. One of the most famous stories of all time that very few guys wanted Jack to know the truth. Tell, tell the one about Terry Funk and, uh, you, and, and Don the Lawman Slatton in Abilene, Texas, ha meeting, having your brother meet the governor of Texas. And, and, uh, and Harley was in on this thing, too. And that... Uh, so anyway, I uh, mess with your brother. He's like the baddest man on the planet. He's like that. That age is Kurt Angle. It's probably the only rib that was ever played on Jack in all of his years in the business, and it was played perfectly. I mean, it was so perfect, and Jack was Jack was so pissed. Uh, it was unbelievable. And he called me after he met the governor, and I just met. Of course, the governor of Texas name was Dolph Briscoe. But with, with an E, you know, and so uh, Jack, Jack had the title 
and uh, they uh, slant and wanted him to uh, stay over and do an interview for him. And Jack wanted, of course, get on the airplane and had to had to had get the hell out of Texas and come back to uh, to Florida. And who wouldn't want to get the hell out of Texas? You did too. So that's anyway, not so what? Frisco, that's not. So nice. they come up with this. They come up with this this great plan. So the Jack had always talked about, you know, the governor being named Briscoe. You know, ribbon Terry and ribbon all those Texans. You know about, you know, you got to have a governor by the name of Briscoe. It's got to be an Oki in there somewhere. So, so any uh, Jack, Jack was getting ready to get on the plane and. Terry, uh, Terry, uh, Terry was dropping him off, or Slatton was dropping him off at the airport. He said, Jack, you've always talked about the governor. And he said, he's coming into town to do an uh, interview, which uh, it was in the paper where uh, Governor Briscoe was coming into, into, I think it was Lubbock or, or one of those towns of Slatton promoted. And uh, he said, do you want to meet him? He, he, and Jack said, of course I do. And Jack uh, Don said, well, I'll change your flight. It's only like two hours difference, you know, and then so uh, we'll, 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 we'll still get you home tonight. Jack said, as long as you'll get me home tonight, uh, I'd love to meet the governor. So they took Jack away from the airport. He was already at the airport. They took him uh, and Jack, Jack was telling me a story and he said, they got to go to this, this ranch where this big Texas rancher was having a, a big, uh, big uh, meet and greet with Governor Briscoe as a fundraiser. So they drove and they drove for, drove for about a half hour. Jack said, where the hell is it? Oh, it's just right down the street there. And about that time, here comes three limousines the other direction, headed back back towards uh, Amarillo. And so uh, Jack said, Who's that? well, that's gotta be the governor. Let me call, uh, uh, let me turn around and catch, catch the car there now. Slatten makes a U-turn. Terry, Terry's in a car with Jack, and uh, so uh, they make the U-turn. They pull up next to this car and they honk and, uh, and they wave. And so the, car, the 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 procession pulls over. There's three limos. Jack told me they all pull over. So this guy gets out and he looks just like Governor Briscoe, white-haired, you know, and distinguished-looking Texan, you know, and all this stuff, and. Uh, Jack goes up to him then, and Terry starts telling me the story from there, because Jack, Jack said, yeah, I met the governor, blah, 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 you know, when he called me. So uh, Jack meeting the governor, oh, it's what an honor, you know, going through all the protocols you go through, uh, what kind of honor it was to meet the governor of Texas, you know, him being a humble Oklahoman, you know, <laughs> and so the guy's playing the role perfectly and everything, so and the governor said, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Briscoe, it was great meeting you, but I've, I've got a meeting up, up the road in Amarillo with, with, with the mayor, and uh, I can't be late for it. And uh, Jack said, well, it was a pleasure meeting you. I got to catch the airplane anyway. Get back in the car, they take off. So nobody tells Jack. They put Jack on an airplane. So Jack is proud as punch, and he got to meet the, the governor of Texas, Dolph Briscoe. He called me, he called my mom, he called my sister, he calls everybody, you know, Jenner and the family. I met the governor, Governor Briscoe. He says he's related to us, and then his family just added an E on the end of it to kind of make 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 it look a little bit different. And so uh, oh great, great. So about two weeks later, Jack's still not in on the rim. We're in uh in St. Louis and Jack, and not St. Yeah, yeah, St. Louis and Jack is working with Harley. Back in the old St. Louis days, they had kind of had a, a class system, dressing room. But I was fortunate enough to go to Jack with my brother. I was fortunate enough to dress with the champion. They had all the, the ex champions in there. They had uh, the Funks in there, Race was in there. I was, uh, I was in there. Jack was in there. So Jack goes and talks to Sam. Sam wants to talk to Jack. So. Dory and Harley come over to me and Terry come over to me and said, did you hear about your brother meeting the governor? I said, yeah. I said, boy, he was, he was really honored. And they both started chuckling. All of them started, I said, why, what, what's so funny? He said, that was a friend of ours. That was a used car salesman. We had him dressed up as the governor. Your brother don't know about it. And we're afraid to tell him. I mean, they're scared <laughs> to death to tell him. And, uh, and Terry, he said, would you tell him? I said, do you want me to tell him? And Harley looked at me, he said, 
please don't tell him tonight. I got to work with it. <laughs> and of course, I couldn't wait to tell Jack after that. So I go out and I'm standing there by Sam's office when Jack comes out. And I see Harley and I see uh, the funks peeking out of, out of Jack's dressing room there. And I said, Jack, come back here. I got to tell you something. So we, I walked back into the dressing room. Harley and, and, and the funks go over in the corner. I said, you know, uh, Governor Briscoe, you met? And he said, yeah. And I'm watching, watching the threesome over in the corner there. They're all, I said, he wasn't the governor. What do you mean he wasn't the governor? And now Jack gets bright red when he gets mad. I mean, just bright red, like when you grab his hair. He did bright red. He said, what do you mean? I said, he's a, a used car salesman for Bamarillo. He's a friend of Don Slatton's. And, uh, he, and he's a, uh, posing as the governor. And they set the whole thing up with a limousine and everything, you know, and it, it was a big rib. And uh, Harley comes up. As soon as I said it was a big rib, Harley comes running out of that recent. Jack, I swear, I didn't have a thing to do with it. I promise you, I didn't have a thing. Harley was scared to death. Jack was going to get mad at him thinking because he was over in the corner with the fox. And all of a sudden, Jack just looked, Terry, you son of a bitch. I'm going to get even with you one down the line. Now Terry's scared to death. You know, I'm working with Terry, I think, that night in the match. And uh, so uh, Junior is the only one that don't have to worry anything that night. And the, uh, Junior came over late. You didn't tell him I had anything to do with it, did you? I said, no, I just told him the funk. So it could have been your dad. I said, Dory, you know, it could have been any, any one of the three of you guys, because they were all big rivers. And so him, uh, Jack and Harley go out and they have the match. And all through the match, Jack, uh, Jack told me Harley kept saying, Jack, I didn't have a thing to do with it. I promise you, I didn't have a thing to do. He said, that's all he talked to me. He didn't care about spots. He didn't care about time. He didn't care about nothing. Just he always cared about Jack was kicking his ass that night. <laughs> But I, I really think that was the only rib that was ever played on my brother. And it, to me, it's one of the all time classic ribs. I mean, uh, on anybody, you know, let alone a world champion. You just didn't rib the world champion, especially when he's a badass like Jack Briscoe. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. He was the modern day, he was back then, Ken Shamrock. I mean, he was, he was in there, or Haku. He was the guy nobody could beat up. He got nobody messed with, nobody pulled his hair when he did want him to. Was well, Don Slatton the promoter? Don Slatton was from Abilene, Texas, right? That's where he's based out of, right? Yeah, he was out of Abilene. He was actually a sheriff in that county there. And I, right. I'm, I'm, you're, you're, you're a great historian, John, and I'm sure you remember the name Billy Saul Estes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He was a crook uh, Texan. Like all the Texans, he was a crook. I think, what, he embezzled some money and, uh, yeah, and yeah. Went to the pit. had to buy some votes or whatever. Well, he was an embezzler. We don't and, cheat in Texas. Ask the Houston Astros. We don't cheat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We just kicked your butt, by the way, too. We don't need to talk so, about that. Anyway, that's right. He, Don, Don was, 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 was the one who arrested Billy Solessis. That's where he got it really claimed the fame in, in that part of Texas. He was the one that arrested Belly Saul Estes. And it was by sheer accident. He was patrolling one day and a car comes speeding by. And so he takes off after the car and he pulls the car over and uh, pulls over and the driver gives him his driver's license, you know, as a uh, lawman. That was the nickname, the lawman, you know. Uh, uh, Don Slatton, the lawman, Don Slatton. You know, that's what it went by his professional name. The lawman looked over and he said, hey, that guy sound, uh, looks familiar over there. And oh, it's just a friend of mine. So he goes back and he pulls up some uh, stuff on their police thing. And sure enough, it's Billy Saul Essence. And he goes up, sir, I'm going to have to put you under arrest. So that, that was Slatton's claim to fame. And that's how he become promoter there in Lubbock, Lubbock, or Amarillo, or Abilene, or whatever. Well, they're all the same, all those towns. Are. In West <laughs> Texas, you know, the dark, sweet water, no water. Waxahachie is the only, the only town that really stands out there. Killer Tim Brooks was from Waxahachie. So was Dickie Murdoch. Oh, Dickie Murdoch. I love Dickie Murdoch. I used to ride the roads with uh, Dickie Murdoch. He, he would say, he, he and Dusty, he and Dusty wrote a song that was Take Me Drunk, I'm Home. That was the song. It was the worst <laughs> thing you ever heard in your life. It was, a, he said it was by Six Pack Productions. And he would sing it over and over and over. I've Dick heard it a million times. Dick would never let me drive.
Well, Mr. Briscoe, ribs are some of the greatest things in this business. This is what I love so much. I didn't care if they're on me, on you. I just like ribs. Everybody did. But Wade Boggs should have been in professional wrestling, Mr. Briscoe. Well, that's right. Now, now you know, John, that, that, that's the, uh, the the program that we have. We have everybody. on Everybody that's tied into wrestling some way. We have Wade Boggs and Mr. Perfect. We're great friends. You, you happen to, we were lucky enough to be on a hunting trip with them. And Jeff Foxworthy, they're, they're, listen to this, this story here by Wade. Man, it's awesome. Jeff Foxworthy was the hottest comedian in the world at the time. And somehow a dead deer winds up in his bed. <laughs> this story told by Wade Boggs, the Major League Baseball 3000 hit Hall of Famer himself. We just had an absolute hoot and just practical joke after practical joke. That was <laughs> That was one of the things that, uh, because Jerry, you know, as well as John, that, that your industry, they cornered the market on practical jokes <laughs> and we, well, us baseball players showed them a few of our own. Okay. So, uh, but, uh, yeah, it was one practical joke after another. And, and, uh, Jeff Foxworthy sort of got caught up in the whole tornado of, uh, all of these <laughs> practical jokes and, that was a that was a, a hoot story. Boggs, I understand now. Too. That was a hoot story. I'm telling you. <laughs> Jeff Foxworthy walked into the bar at one point, and he he was such a good sport, by the way. And he was on fire back in the back when the, then he was probably the hottest comedian in the country at the time. And he walked in, he put his wallet on the bar, and he said, "I can't whip anybody in here, but if somebody will beat up Wade Boggs and Kurt Heating, you can have whatever's in my wallet." <laughs> 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 it was so that was funny. What was... happened, though? I mean, you know, the guy John's told me the story several times, and I laugh my ass off every time. So, what exactly that? Well, he it, shot it, here and it, or it, it was one of those. It was one of those. We had to we had to go up by Selma to uh, stay at uh, uh, Jimmy Hinton's uh, the Sedgefields, and and they had cabins and and various things. So uh, there was a three bedroom cabin there for me and Perfect and and Jeff Foxworthy and perfect had just come off of some knee surgery. So he was icing his knee and everything. And after the hunt climbing down out of the tree stand. So we're sitting in the living room and Kurt goes over to the refrigerator and gets a, a baggie and starts filling it up with ice. And, and I said, I said, uh, what in the hell are you doing? And he says, Oh, I'm going to ice my knee. I said, Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? I said, oh, does her knee hurt? And so I'm just, I'm going like this. So I'm saying, hey, we can, we can get Foxworthy. Why don't we just pretend that a battle royal starts and we'll just act like you're mad at me. I'm mad at you. And let's see how far it goes. Well, it, it went a little <laughs> too far. We started breaking plates over each other and, and, and he, chest slap me and Kurt had the best chest slap in the on the planet <laughs> and he'd knock me into next week and I'd chest slam him and Foxworthy was just absolutely going bonkers <laughs> he said would you guys please stop he, he says I don't have a lot of money but I'll give you anything just to stop <laughs> and we just kept going and he went back to his room and locked the door door well Kurt threw me through his door so I go flying into his room land on the bed Kurt picks up a Scrabble game and hits me overhead with a Scrabble game now I look over at Foxworthy and he's got an X a Q a R and an I stuck on his face so I'm sitting there laughing so dadgum hard that we both look at Foxworthy and go we got you so the next night was the banquet and Foxworthy just, he says, you might be a redneck if you go hunting with Boggs and Perfect and a battle royal breaks out. <laughs> and he was telling all of these redneck jokes and every one of them had something to do with me and Perfect. And it was just one of those moments that just escalated and escalated and, and Foxworthy was caught in this whole tornado of a, of a storm and, and, uh, so we went back uh, the next year and Foxworthy was there again. So, well, he was staying at the lodge this time. We didn't have to go to Sedgefields or anything like that. He was staying at the lodge. So about three thirty, four o'clock in the morning, perfect picks his lock on his door 
and fire extinguisher thing. Remember that, John? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that was, absolutely. That was, and Foxworthy comes out and he is just, he looks like the, uh, the, the marshmallow man. He's all white. He's got, uh, he's got the fire extinguisher all over him. His room is, you can't see in his room because <laughs> of the fire extinguisher went off. And Foxworthy comes out and says, if I can find a gun, I'm going to shoot Boggs and him. <laughs> and, and everybody goes, hide your guns, hide your guns, Foxworthy's on the, on the loose. And, and people started waking up and, and, and they'd open their door and look at Foxworthy. And he's just, he's just this white ghost walking down, up and down the, the, uh, the hallways. But we just, we just tore into him and it was just so much fun. And, Everybody got a big hoot out of it. Hey, Jerry, you got to understand, we had, there was, uh, Aaron Tippin was there, John Anderson, uh, Chipper Jones was there one year, all the wrestlers, I mean, the, and one of the Mandrell sisters, the stories in the bar yeah. were legendary. I mean, it, uh, was, it was a really good time. And at one, at of- one point, Fox really had a buck, uh, deer, a deer end up in his bed, didn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. We took uh, we took the deer heads off. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We took the deer heads <laughs> off the wall and, and filled up his room with all the deer heads. So, and then and then we locked the door from the outside. And then in the morning, he's trying to open the door. Well, the guy that owned the lodge comes out and he goes, "Where in the heck's all the deer heads?" I said, "I don't know. I think Foxworthy's trying to steal them." So he goes and opens up Foxworthy's door, and there's probably ten or twelve deer heads in his room, and. <laughs> Hey Jerry, and one of the best parts was, you know, Foxworthy was the hottest guy in the country at the time. He was, I mean, he was on fire, and so they gave him like the prime, you know, the prime locations and stuff. You know, every time he had shot a deer and he couldn't find it. It was right at night. There was a little bit of rain. Had dogs. They're trying to, but they never. I don't think they ever found it. So when he comes back, all those dead bucks are in his room, and one of them had a note on it said, "If you're looking for a dead buck, that's what it looks like." (laughs) That was from Kirk. (laughs) Well, that that's when cool. Foxworthy walked into the bar and put his wallet on the bar and said, I'll give whatever's in my wallet for somebody to beat up Wade Boggs and Kurt Henning. <laughs> oh, uh, we had so much fun. Sometimes, Mr. Briscoe, a rib, you're not sure if it is or not. That's the best one to have on the ball. And he Slater tells a story about your good friend and a person that I like very much. I love his son, Nick Patrick, great friends with him. Never really that close to Jody because I wasn't around him but one of your good friends with the legendary Jody Hamilton. Well, I, I was dear friends with Jody. We go way, way back to when I was a puppy, just my second or third match in the business. But Jody, I, I know those shorts that, that, that Nick was describing. Yeah. He, he wore those old basketball shorts that he wore. You know, Jody was a hefty man. And Jody wore those shorts. They would, he would pull them up to his chest you know, where they'd yeah. hang over. And anyway, they... He didn't have much down and the old baggy leg basketball short. Jody, listen to Nick tell a story there. <laughs> and he tells us this story of one of the greatest times ever. Mr. Heath Slater himself. But Jody had this, um, you know, the, the, the wheelie chairs, wherever, you know, you sit back, you can just move your feet and wheel around everywhere. And he would always wheel around and all this stuff, but Jody would always wear short, short, short shorts, but they'd be baggy, <laughs> but they'd be baggy as hell, you know? And I don't know if Jody just didn't like wearing underwear, if it was uncomfortable for him or what. I don't know. But just imagine this, you know, <laughs> locker room full of boys. You know, and he would bring you in like, you know, hey, here's this match. Come in here. All right, you other guys talk over shit over there, you know, or watch whatever, you know? So, you know, we're all in here, you know, and it was like an eight-man tag or something, and we're all in the daggone room. Jody's sitting there on the thing with the the, uh, the chair, and he spins around, and he's, like, doing that old man, like, <laughs> elbow, arm like that, you know? But his ball sack is hanging out of his shorts, you know? And we're all, like, looking at him. And then I like look down where I'm just like, oh shit, this is nuts. You know? And and I'm just, and you know, without saying a word, you just look around on other, other people's faces and they're like, yeah, we see that shit too. Don't say nothing, yeah. you know? <laughs> but but the funny thing about it is, is that he would swing back around and watch and you don't see nothing. 
but then he'll swing back around and like talk about something and you just see it just like you know just like wobble and we're like oh you know we're like trying to take this serious but you know, you well, got a little, you know, you got a little ball sack. Well, there's a nutsack hanging you know? in front of your face. How do you take it serious, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, did anybody ever smarten him up? No. We we just just the only probably knew was just use him. <laughs> hey, either he was ripping the hell out of us because he knew that, you know, we could take it, or he had no idea that that cool breeze was just going right up around his balls. Or something. I don't know. Yeah, he went back and he went back and told Nick. He goes, "Yeah, I'm sitting there with my balls hanging out." Oh, he you go? lost you. Hold on, hold on, hold on. John, put your legs together. Put your knees together, John. So I don't. Want to <laughs> yeah, that's go. right. <laughs> you know, if, if Jody was actually ribbing you guys, it's the greatest rib of all time. Hey, honestly, he might have been, man, because like, who knows? Well, Mr. Risco, you have some rivals for greatest plane ride stories with Eddie Graham. You told one about Rocky Johnson, and that's the one coming up, Mr. Briscoe. Oh, man, what, what a story. We were in Miami. We used to get rent, rent out of old Tampa Air Center out here. We'd get all the little twin, twin beaches, get to all the old airplanes, and we'd hire a pilot that was a Vietnam pilot or somewhere. One day, I mean, holy cow, started smelling smoke. And Rocky Johnson didn't like the smell of the smoke. And he didn't like what where the smoke was coming from. He literally jumped out of a moving airplane. <laughs> I don't know what Rocky was mad at. Maybe the plane was on fire. Here's one of the best Eddie Graham plane ride stories ever. Got Eddie Graham down here in Florida flying the plane while he was drinking. And uh, you know, but and it's no worse than getting in the ring with Buddy Austin or, or Brute Menard when they've been drinking. Did you? Was you ever a part of, of the of the flight uh, when when Eddie was on the on the booze? I, we ended up in Ocala one night from <laughs> Miami to Ocala. And you were going to Tampa, right? <laughs> no, we're coming home from Miami. And, we're and you landed in Ocala. That's about two hundred miles down the way, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one hundred fifty, one hundred twenty past Tampa. See, yeah, John, I'm not the only one. Oh my God! Did, wait a minute! Wait a minute! Did, did you land in Ocala? No, no. He, I don't know how he turned around and came back. Was he going to land in Ocala? I don't even know. He knew we were there. <laughs> <laughs> he probably did. <laughs> this, is like, this is just drives me. This is insane. Does it not bother you to get it with there with the pilot that is? So John, it does, it does now, it does now, John, but it did back then. You just wanted to get off. You wanted to save that six hour Miami trip because back then we had no interstate. We we you know, it was no. highway 41. You know, you get on those two days to go through alligator alley, you know, dodge alligators and the damn water moccasins, you know. Alligators so that 20 minute flight was a hell of a lot more appealing, even with a drunk pilot. So you're thinking if you live, you get home pretty quick. Yeah, well, you know, you've been behind the wheel, and we're all dumbass. We got behind the wheel with a guy just as drunk as Eddie was behind the wheel of the damn airplane, you know. And they usually <laughs> yeah, said that, usually yeah. said in that co pilot seat, somebody had a little bit of experience, you know. Like Terry Falk. Terry I, Falk, didn't yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know that Eddie drunk while he was flying. You know, I knew he was a drinker, but no, I. I never knew. I said he wouldn't drink while he's driving and was flying. <laughs> Little did I know that he he didn't fly unless he was drunk. Yeah. <laughs> and he was good <laughs> at it too. <laughs> he's he landed a couple times at the wrong place, didn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Like he landed, landed, like landed the wrong way several. Right? Landed, landed the wrong way and took off the wrong way a few times. He took off the wrong way at airport. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, Jerry. Jerry, what about Old Blue? The old. Old Blue, yeah. Old yeah blue. We used to, we used to name our airplanes down there. We had Old Blue, Old, old Red, and Old Orange. We had a lot of them down there. We had that, that, that old... we had that tail dragger that caught on fire that time. Rocky Johnson jumped out of the airplane as we were taxiing down the highway. He saw smoke in the back of the airplane. He was sitting back by one of those drop down doors and he dropped that damn door down. And was we were taxi that jumped out of the damn thing. We went, what the hell is he doing? He's crazy. All of a sudden we saw the smoke coming out. We all wanted to jump out of the door too. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a fire. 
Yeah, there's a fire, fire in the commode, man. Somebody been back there in the doobie or something, I think. <laughs> Your kid went, oh, wait a minute. So somebody's smoking <laughs> on the plane and gets the plane on fire? Yeah, back, back, in, those days, that back in those days, you could smoke on commercial planes, you know, so it wasn't anything. I know, unusual. but you normally don't catch the plane on fire. Yeah, you, uh, you normally. Uh, <laughs> this, these, these planes we're talking about, they go on the runway and they'd rattle as they went along the runway and they go, uh, 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 trying to get off the fucking ground, trying to get up into the air. And they growled, uh, they growled trying to get up. And they never paid any attention to how much you weighed, you know. I mean, the guys, you know, the, the wrestling crew get on there, and some of the biggest guys on there, you know, and some of the biggest guys, stars in the country, are on that damn airplane, you know. If it gone down, they killed half the territories in the United States. <laughs> so, what happened to the plane that caught on fire? Oh, they pulled it, out, pulled it over the side of the runway. The fire truck came out, put the commode out, and we got back on the airplane, flew to Miami. Did Rocky get back on? Yeah, he got back on. Yeah, he wanted to get to Miami. So Rocky jumped out going down the tarmac. We're going, you know, we're going down the runway, man. Going down the runway? Well, we all were taxiing out to take off. I, you know, we all, we all kidding. Rocky, if we'd been up off, would you jump out? He said, hell yes. <laughs> so then you put the fire out and Rocky just gets back on the plane and you guys He take just off. gets back on the plane. We all just get back on the plane like it's another Wednesday, you know? Does that that doesn't seem normal to me? Luke, have back me up on this, man. <laughs> yeah, mate. Crazy things back in those days, mate. <laughs> well, Mr. Briscoe, road stories are the best. But something happened in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, that Bubby Dudley told us about that I even had you shocked, right? Oh, man, unique thing, but what Bubba and you saw in, 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 in Iowa tops them all. Listen to this story. This one is insane. I remember coming down into the lobby to pick up my food, and I look into the bar, and I see you in the bar with this look on your face. You have this blank look on your face, like the thousand-yard stare that a Marine gets. And you're just looking across the bar, and you're like, Bubba, come here. And you called me yes. in the bar. Yes. And it what was, was going a, on? Uh, there was Cedar, a convention. Cedar Ames, Cedar Ames Iowa. Uh, Cedar Ames, uh, Cedar Falls. It was in Iowa. It was in Iowa. Yeah, okay. Cedar Middle Rapids. the country. Because it was the middle of nowhere. Yes, I remember. And what did, kind of did convention? Did they have clothes on? They, oh, they had clothes on. No, they, they, <laughs> I had clothes on, too. No, no. It was a... Uh, like a transvestite dress up convention, but it was guys it was like farm guys. So it wasn't like guys who were trying to look like women. It was like big six foot four inch burly guys who looked like they just got off a tractor and they're all wearing dresses, high heels, everything. And there's like the whole bar is full of them. And I'm sitting there just looking at trying to figure out what's going on. I can't believe it. And that's what I called Bubba over. I said, I said, Bubba, come here. I said, you got to look at that. Look at this. And so we're sitting there looking at him. Then I called Taker. I said, you got to come downstairs. I said, I don't know what's going on. I said, you got to come see this. He goes, I mean, I said, come downstairs. So he came downstairs and all the boys come down there. So now you got all the wrestlers on one side. Oh. You got all these farm boys in dresses on the other side. And we're all looking at each other. And they're pointing at us. They went, look, that's the wrestlers. We're pointing at them going, those are farm boys for some reason in dresses. <laughs> <laughs> it was the craziest thing ever. Ever. We had a, we had a great time with them. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We've got to walk over there. What are you doing? And they're going, well, you just dress up in dresses. And I, oh, okay. Man, that so we was started funny. talking to them. They were, they were funny guys. So next thing you know, you get all the wrestlers sitting with all the guys that are dressed up. Nobody gave, nobody gave a shit about none of them. I don't care. Oh. We had the best night that night with all of those guys. And the, the if you try to tell the story of it, it's almost impossible to do. I wish somebody would have videotaped that. That 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 was funny because yeah. just that look on your face, like you could not believe what you would you needed somebody to confirm what you were seeing. You're <laughs> like, right. it's, it's like we were sneaking up on a herd of water buffalo. You're like, <laughs> look right. over there. <laughs> be, be, be very still. They can't see us. Yeah. <laughs>
Oh, oh, it was great. Uh, Baker came down to the same thing. He just looked. He goes, and just looked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was uh, awesome. <laughs> Mr. Briscoe, it is hard to describe. I would love to have seen the promo that Dusty Rhodes cut on Brian Blair when Brian told us a story about what happened down in New Orleans where Brian Blair relieved himself. Mr. Briscoe, you know Dusty. This had to be a gym, huh? Oh, man, Dusty, 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 when he wanted to. Dusty was the most entertaining guy, yeah. not only in the ring, but backstage to the boys. That's the reason he's so beloved here. Just listen to this story, Beeper Toad. Brian Blair going <laughs> to the bathroom on Dusty Roads. All Dusty Roads, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the bartender. I'm in my old Lincoln bar, uh, Lincoln Continental. Uh, actually, Dusty's the bartender. And the heater doesn't work. We're in Mississippi and uh, in Jackson, and we've got to drive 220 miles north to Greenville. It's uh, the middle of winter, but uh, uh, Andre comes out in a Waiavea, and Dusty's got a like a T-shirt, uh, a West Texas State T-shirt. Uh, he comes out to my car and. The boss says hello. You know, uh, it was so much fun because Andre and I would always ride. There's a lot of stories with him, but uh, uh, and of course the relationship with Dusty. So the three of us are about to embark on a great journey, and I'm just grateful to be there. You know, my first territory here, away from home. And uh, Dusty says, "Hey, Beaver," he says, "Listen, the boss likes to drink, and I need you to go to the liquor stall." And he goes, "It's cold out." And uh, uh, he said, uh, I need you to get two coolers. I said, two coolers. He said, yeah, we got to pee in one cooler. And we'll put the alcohol in the other cooler. So get a small cooler, as explained. And he goes, get Andre two bottles of Crown Royal. Get him a, a case of Budweiser, I think he was drinking. Then get me a case of Lone Star. And you're driving. You could have a six pack, any kind you want. Hands me a few hundred dollars. So I get go to the liquor store, get all this stuff, bring it back, got the ice, the beer done. Got to entertain these guys, but I'm scared to death now um, because my heater won't work, but the defroster works, so I could pretend anyway, and I'm just kind of working and see what happens. Well, at that time, it was uh, you know one o'clock, twelve o'clock in the afternoon. The sun shining, it's about forty degrees in Jackson. It was nice, so we take off, and everybody's drinking on the way there. <laughs> um, and Dusty starts going, God dang, it's getting cold in here. Beepa. And the boss is just, oh, 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 he's already got a bottle of Crom down before we get to Greenville. And Dusty said, uh, Beepa, you're going to be on uh, before us. I want you to come out here and turn the heater on. There's no shower in here, no cold, no hot water. He already knew that. And uh, we're going to we're going to come out here and uh, uh, into the car when it's heated up. Get ready to go. So I said, OK, I'll be ready. So I was in there, just put my sweats back on over my tights and stuff. They got their gimmicks back on. It's coldish. Oh, so cold. They get in the car and I got, turn that heater on, turn that heater on. So I got the defroster off. Shh. They get the antifreeze and Dusty's bartending. We're going down the road, peeing in the cooler. I had to pee. They had, he had a McDonald's cup that he brought to him, big McDonald's cup. So that cooler, that little cooler is getting really full of urine. And, uh, it's Dusty's riding the straddle because he's listening to this to the he's talking to the giant the giant's talking to him and I'm just like a fly on the wall so happy to be there I'm listening to these stories and somebody said something funny and the boss all of a sudden he goes forward and uh almost touches the may have touched the dashboard in my Lincoln Continental my 72 powder blue Lincoln Continental and uh it's got about 270,000 miles on it at this time. And uh, he moves forward and he moves backwards laughing so hard the seat breaks, hits Dusty and squashes the cooler. So the urine goes all over Dusty. Dusty starts cutting a promo on me as if I did it. He goes, God damn people, you're black bald. You'll never wrestle again. You embarrass me in front of Andre the Giant. We're right here, the two greatest sports attractions in the world of wrestling. And you pee on me. God damn you people. It's going on and on cutting this promo so finally he loosens up a little and the boss was so entertained he found so much relief i guess in the boss's humor and andre's hu and andre being so so happy so we get back and andre's still laughing at dusty's expense and i'm feeling like a whipped puppy dog 
And uh, so we're together for a week and we got to go to New Orleans pretty soon. So uh, we got a day off and we go to Felix's oyster place. And uh, I forget who didn't want to eat uh, oysters. They had shrimp, drinking beer. And finally, we're, it's time to leave. And in New Orleans, there was a place right down from Felix's where this uh, mannequin went in and out of this top of this store. I don't know if you, uh, you remember that uh, on Bourbon Street, but I guess it was a booby bar and uh, they want to go. The boss wants to go there. You got to go wherever Andre wants to go. And uh, there's a little place I could see on the way there. I said, I, I got to pee, guys. I got to pee. He said, no, no, you're going to pee right there. It's just right up here. I said, I don't, OK. So I follow uh, uh, Dusty and Andre. And there's a, a flight of uh, the stairs go like this. Then there's a platform. And the other set of stairs go off to the right, but you really can't see anything. And we're walking up the stairs and all of a sudden the lights go out. It's pitch black. I mean, you couldn't see anything. Andre goes, hold on to your poke. So I feel for my wallet. I got my wallet. Okay. And, you know, Dusty's there. and uh, It's, uh, I got to pee. And so I could kind of feel, what are you doing? I'm nothing, 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 nothing. No, there's, there's like a plastic palm tree in the corner of that platform. So I turn around, I start peeing in that palm tree. I didn't say nothing to them because I, I didn't want anybody to say anything. And just as I get my zipper up, the lights come back on. And uh, I look and Dusty always wore his jeans inside of his cowboy boots. And I wasn't peeing on the palm tree. I was peeing on Dusty's leg and it filled his boot up with urine. And he's shaking his leg. He's going, God damn, God damn. People, you didn't piss on me, did you? Oh, eh, I don't know. Uh, I hope not. And uh, I peed in the palm tree. And he pulls his boot and dumps it out. And Andre is, uh, he's laughing so hard again. And Dusty cuts another promo on me and tells me to get out of the building. I, it's, it was terrible. I mean, I didn't mean to do that. But, uh, you know, it was, it was actually really funny watching the American dream with it. it looked like he wet his pants and urine was all in his boot and, you know to see andre laugh like that was priceless more you know this is funny how most road stories happen in florida the home of the briscoes this is one mr briscoe that could have happened to the old briscoe car isn't that right well that's right and you know dogs have a unique sense of smell and this dog having to smell something in godfather's car that's just set him off there was a full moon and he was howling at the moon what kind of thing <laughs> yeah the dog was howling all right and it was something about Godfather. Me and Ron were doing our best not to get everybody arrested. Here is the story from Florida. We're, we're in Florida one time, and me and Ron are driving down the road. We see you and Visceral pulled over by a cop with a dog. And so we pull over and think, oh, man, we got to help him out. So we get out, and there's this cop there talking to you. And you go, hey, man, this guy recognized me and Visceral. Want to take a picture? He goes, here's the APA. You want to take a picture? So me and Ron say, hey, Godfather, listen, uh, we'll take a picture with you guys. Go on. And the, the guy has a dog in his back, in his back uh, seat. And the dog's going, oh! <laughs> <laughs> And he's wagging his tail. He's scratching at the window. He's trying to get out. And the cop looks around and he goes, Oh, yeah, yeah, my dog recognizes you, too. Like, Ron, Ron goes, Charles, get out of here. Get out of here. The guy's just taking pictures. <laughs> I uh, I remember we, me and Vistler were, that's when Vistler was ridding, remember those big expeditions? Yeah, yeah, you know, sure did. The big forge, and so uh, Vist was riding by himself, and so I'd be like, come on, Vist, I'll, I'll jump in with you. So he was, I was smoking, and he was, he had a halibut. I, I, you know what a briefcase if people don't know what a, it's a stainless steel <laughs> briefcase that when you think you got a little money you buy it's yes so, every ever ever wrestler it makes a first thousand dollar paycheck by the oliver yeah and so viscera is rolling a blunt on the uh on the, on the oliver and i'm driving smoke and all of a sudden the cop passes us and looks at me hits it hits behind us and hits the lights i'm like oh shit as this was rolling and uh, it was a canine unit. But yeah, just like John said, it's how it happened. And so uh, I, yeah, and believe me, the cop, I thought, I thought he smelled it, but maybe he didn't. But I mean, <laughs> the dog was going crazy. And he's like, oh yeah, my dog's a wrestling fan too. He recognized you guys. <laughs> the dog's just howling. And I, but I know, I don't care what anybody, 
that the cop smelt it. He just let me go. He let it fly. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. There's no doubt about it. And the and the poor dog was like, "Come on, you gotta uh, let me out. I've hit the I've hit the mother <laughs> load." The dog's like that. The dog's going into convulsions. Yeah. Stuff. Or give me a treat or something. <laughs> Well, Mr. Briscoe, we're going to go out all over the world on this show. This happened down in South Africa, and I still don't totally believe what you had to say about me this morning, but go ahead. Well, John, you know, you want to take care of your, take care of your guys, and your guy that I brought on board at WWE, as the world knows, and, uh, you know, and I did hire you in a shower, and then <laughs> I had to come and rescue you because we have a strict rule of leaving guys behind that don't make the bus call on time. Well, I'm not going to leave behind one of my boys. So I found you, your spread eagle up against the shower. But there was one problem. And you listen to this story, you'll find out what that problem was. <laughs> this allegedly is true. Yep. We're, we're in South Africa. Jerry comes up to my room and he goes, what are you doing? And I said, Mr. Briscoe, I'm taking a shower. I'm going to run a little late, okay? And he says, we're waiting on you. And he goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking a shower, Mr. Briscoe. I'll be down there as soon as I can. He said, there's no water running. I'm just standing in the shower. There's no oh. water. And I don't know how long I've been there. Nothing. I'm just standing there. He's Dylan, he's doing one of these, you know, with his hand holding himself up against the shower, up against the shower wall, just holding. And I'm standing there, you know, we're late. You know how the bus, you know, you take off, you know. And, and so I'm not going to leave, 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 Phil. So I go, I go up, get, get the key to the room, go up. And he's standing in the shower getting ready. John, John, come on, what are you doing? Well, I'm showering, Mr. Briscoe. I'm going to be ready in a couple of minutes. I'm showering. I look, I said, don't you think it'd work better if you turned the water on? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Briscoe, it's about as far as you can go from South Africa. We're going to your home state of Oklahoma, and it was on your birthday. And just like today, but I don't know if people are watching the show, you had a certain dinner with a certain person, you might say. Right, Mr. Briscoe? That's right, Eric Bishop, my 60th birthday, 16 years ago. And, uh, and, but Eric Bishop, John Cena, we talked about this story today, but Eric and I re, re, renewed our friendship today at a local established down the street. We talked, John Cena, he's, he's the biggest, biggest uh, pain in the ass that you can be around. And, well, you, you, you get him with John, uh, Bruce Pritchard and John Layfield, then nobody wins, but those two guys had me and Eric who are the nice, two nicest guys in the world. To, and, and you guys had us on the floor at a bar, at a hotel bar in Tulsa, Florida, at Tulsa, Oklahoma. Two men rolling around in suits in a full bar. Hey, well, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. Now, now Mr. Bris Mr. Bischoff. You Please call me that? Eric, damn it. Please call me Eric. Okay, Eric. You did say that the only reason that Mr. Briscoe stretched you in Oklahoma in his home state on his birthday was because you felt sorry for a 60 year old man. I didn't say that. You're putting words in my mouth. What I said was there were people there. It was in public. We were in a bar. Granted, we had run most of the people out of the bar, but there was still a bartender there and I think a waitress by about two o'clock in the morning when all these shady shenanigans took place. But still, Bruce was there, and John Cena was there. I, it was Gerald's birthday. I, you know, I, I didn't feel sorry for him, but I wanted to be kind. And what I said was, don't ever confuse kindness for weakness. But I, I was kind. I not only did Mr. Briscoe take me down and <clears throat> somewhat embarrass me, just a little bit. Hey, Eric, I got to tell you the truth on that. After all these years, John, I'm going to tell the truth. Eric, you didn't even know you, you'd had so many adult beverages that you were feeling pretty good. And, you know, I was feeling pretty good, too. But when we locked up, John Cena looked at me and weak, like pushed him toward me. So I, I gave you a little shove. John stuck his foot out there, and you tripped and fell on it, fell right on your damn back and didn't even know it. And then so you guys are you guys are busting my chops for being an evil person who's trying to take money away from you. And here's Gerald admitting to the world that he had to cheat in order to beat me on his. I did day. cheat. John Cena's the cheat. <laughs> John Cena's a cheat out there. So Eric, you you're saying that I've been stating that I've never once come out and said I did. A, it's usually Layfield or that damn guy that your cohort that you worked there with, not billionaire Tony, but that other billionaire to be uh, big old Bruce Pritchard. 
He's the one that <laughs> instigated. Those two guys are really the ones that instigated that whole deal. You and I were sitting there having a good time, very cordial towards each other and, and enjoying ourselves in Oklahoma, having a nice cold beer. And all of a sudden, Layfield and Cena, they start piping off where they kind of paint us into the corner where we both look like, you know, we don't have anything between our legs if we don't do something. So <laughs> it's not your fault or my fault. It's, it's actually that guy in the corner up there. Uh-huh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I was now there. the crew that's coming out and watch, watch that taxi <laughs> back up there. That's I'm gonna, I got words like for it. Cena next time I see John Cena. That's that the I worst the recollection truth. of a story I've ever heard, Jerry. That that was that that did not happen. I do remember Eric Bischoff saying, "He can't be that good." <laughs> and, that's, and that's when the whole that's when furniture started spreading back. <laughs> and you get that cockeyed look, and you're sideways because you're all from Oklahoma and you're drinking too much, and you want to stretch somebody. And Eric actually says, "I'll give it a go." <laughs> which I give him a lot of credit for. You guys are both in suits in the middle of a bar. <laughs> and Eric didn't give it a go. It just didn't work. Wasn't much of a go. But not for too long. It, it wasn't much of a go. But well for Eric. You, you, know what the, you know what the best part of the story was? And I haven't talked about this to many people, but of course I was out with you guys all day. What are we out till two, three, whatever it was in the morning? I had to get up early and catch a flight, fly all the way back to Phoenix where I lived at the time. So I looked like I got run over by a train. I had mat burns on my face. My elbows were all burned up. I looked like shit anyway, because I was so hung over. My face was swollen the size of a, 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 of a basketball. My eyes were just these little slits. And I had a broken thumb. So I can, I finally get home the next morning. I, and, from and, my eyes, <laughs> I get home the next day and I walked in the door looking like death warmed over and like I got my ass kicked, which I did. And my wife said, well, how was TV? And I said, TV was all right, but man, hanging out afterwards was a blast. And I went right to bed and slept for six hours. <laughs> well, Mr. Briscoe, we've had some great stories and we got as we're reminding each other in the breaks, we have just as many uh, that we didn't put up as we have put up. But this one to me is my favorite. Hornswoggle under a ring in Mexico. Dave Fit Finley somehow finds out he's scared of chickens <laughs> and a chicken ends up under the ring with him. And it's, we have video of this. Mr. Briscoe, this is my favorite story. Well, it should be. John, I got to give credit for you. You went and researched the WWE archives and folks, there's, as you can imagine, there's millions and millions and millions of reels of, uh, of film in there. Some of it's so far back that you just got to really search for. John went up there and spent a week up there in, in the archives of WWE along with the great Ben Brown and they were able to pull this thing out and you're going to laugh as hard as we do. Man, Hornswoggle and a rooster under the ring in Mexico. We've got Hornswoggle, we've got Fit Finley, we've got a ring in Mexico, and we have video footage that has never been seen. What I think is our greatest story, here it is. We, we were on a tour in South America or wherever, and we went, so I think one of our stops, we were in Mexico somewhere, and uh, we're on a flight between shows, and Scott Acock, who's you know the security guy, yeah, great, great okay. guy. Ex, ex cop, ex military, great guy. So he's 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 going. You know that little son of a gun. He's like just ribbing me all the time. He's I, how I gonna get him back? I I may have bullied Scott Acock a little bit, just a tad. I may have done that, but it doesn't. It did not. It shouldn't have caused this. You know he's afraid of chickens. And he looked. He's like, how how do you know he's afraid of chickens? I said, well, there was a there was a thing in uh, Kali was doing. He had all the all the Indian women around him dancing and, and they had chickens and goats and all that stuff. And I seen Swoggle sell the chickens. I'm going like, his, he had bug eye going like, I'm, I'm, so I watched the fear in Swoggle when he's looking at the chickens. I said, I know he's afraid of chickens. People fear a lot of things. The two things I fear are the dark and, ch and, and I would say birds in general. Birds are unpredictable, especially chickens and roosters. They have talons. This is a phobia of mine. And of a lot of people, that's a good thing. Like that, that's it's a common thing that is 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 not crazy at all. 
They have talent. They train roosters to fight. The chickens. Just what, 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 what we do. And, and wait a minute. So your evil self just puts that back in the bank just for yeah. like. Yeah. Listen, right. on my phone, I've got on my in my notes on my phone, I've got a, a huge lift, list of what everyone's afraid of. <laughs> people say something, I go, oh, that's going in my phone. <laughs> I don't know when I'm going to use it, but I'm sure it's going to come up at some point. <laughs> but it's a hundred percent right. They had a they had that segment in the ring, and I remember just kind of looking at the chicken side-eyed and fit sees these things but he now puts this in his phone so now when he wants to get me with something aka a, a killer rooster a menacing chicken that could have killed me a killer rooster a uh, what a killer uh, rooster yeah 100, it had talons john <laughs> it could have killed me so we called david coach's you know, one of the English guys that does the production for Kent, Brent, Kent, I think he works for W or did work for WWE. So I was like, hey, Davey, can you get us a chicken? Yeah, what, was it fried or boiled? No, no, no. I, got <laughs> <laughs> I want a live chicken. So I came up with this plan that, because we put Hornswoggle under the ring. So I came up with this plan that we'll put him under the ring and then we'll throw the chicken under the ring. <laughs> we get Swoggle under the ring. And we rig up lights under the ring and we got a camera. So we've got the cameraman going to film this. Here goes Masters Pyro. We get <laughs> while everybody's looking at Masters, the chicken gets the, it's a friggin' rooster. It, I mean it's a big white rooster. <laughs> so it goes under the ring and you hear ah! <laughs> And he swipe the chickens running because it's scared too, right? It's running around. He's swiping at, the, at this rigging rooster, and he's screaming and he's swearing at it. And and there's lights on and and they're running around in circles, chasing each other like this under the ring. And I see behind me the apron flap, and I was like, ah, this, something took a bump above me and just popped the apron. And now I see a camera under there, and I go, why the hell is there a camera under the ring? And then I turn. And I'm eye to eye with this goddamn rooster, John. <laughs> and, and I was not happy at all. So now I'm, I, I, I think I'm going to throw the, my whole spot away. I, I'm going to run out. I'm going to run out from under the apron if it comes at me. So there was a kendo stick and like my jacket. I remember grabbing the kendo stick thinking if it comes at me, which it's going to because it's menacing, I'm going to swing at this. <laughs> The chicken comes out from under the ring, jumps in the crowd. Well, we're in Mexico. They catch it and throw it back over the barrier. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, it gets out, comes back one more time, and it gets away. I, oh, I, I have goosebumps now thinking of it. That, this is, it was the worst, the absolute, uh, too far. I could have been killed. Well, Mr. Briscoe, it has been fun doing this show with you. We started doing this during COVID because we just want to make people smile, make people laugh like we do. And we enjoy it every single week. We have so much fun with these guys that would come on and tell these stories that if you're not in this business, you probably wouldn't believe. Right, Mr. Briscoe? Well, you know, we're in the business of some of the stories we don't even believe. Uh, Scott Casey and and a, and a, and a UFO. I mean, I believe it because I, I, I love Scott. And I've made a million miles with Scott. And I and I, I but I still can't wait to to verify the story of Mel Mascaris and hear his version. But folks, John, like John said, we started this to entertain uh, ourselves, and 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 it just slowly uh, turned into this thing here. We appreciate you. Listen to.
comments to us. Tell us we suck. Tell us you don't like us. But subscribe to us, and, and you'll enjoy these stories. They might be unbelievable, but they're true stories.